recording here too. So we are set. I'm going to give Facebook just a minute to kind of notify everybody that we're here and that we're live. So give them a minute or two to get settled in. So I'm just going to say hello to Herbert. Hello, Herbert. Hello, Julie. Where are you calling in from, Herbert, right now? Florida. Florida. Okay. So, and Bob, you, hello to you, Bob. Hello, Julie. You are calling in from a wonderful San Diego as I... <laughs> I am. I'm downtown in my chambers, which has a beautiful view of the ocean, which also means the sun is shining directly on me. So we're trying to cope with that. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're, you've got good lighting going so far. So we actually have both coasts covered. So hopefully we've got people joining us from those coasts and maybe somewhere in between as well. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar, Warwick's is actually located in La Jolla, San Diego. We're just a little bit north of where you are, Judge, uh, but we are... I'm actually up in Carlsbad doing this from my home office. So um, we, as my little sign there says, we've been um, established since 1896. We, we celebrated our 125th anniversary last year. Actually been in, in San Diego since the 30s. So we are a well-established old bookstore here in San Diego. So for tonight, we are going to, um, Herbert and Bob are gonna chat about Herbert's book, The Sins of Our Fathers about 35-ish minutes, um, depending on how many questions we get from you as the audience, please feel free in that comment section to put your questions in. Um, I will come back on about that 35, 40 minute mark and we'll feed those questions into the conversation at that point. But in the meantime, also in that comment section, I'm going to put how to order Herbert's book. So um, there's, if you're in the San Diego area, we would love for you to stop by and pick that up directly from us. But we also, independent bookstores do ship books. So we will ship that book out to you as well. So um, I've given Facebook a couple minutes to let everybody know that we're here. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce these two gentlemen and let the conversation begin. So Herbert J. Stern was born in New York City, attended Hobart College and earned his law degree from the University of Chicago. He was formerly US attorney for the District of New Jersey and prosecuted the mayors of Newark, Jersey City, and Atlantic City. He also served as judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey and as judge of the United States Court for Berlin. There he presided over a hijacking trial in the occupied American sector of West Berlin. His book about the case, Judgment in Berlin, when the 19th, there you go, there it is, <laughs> <laughs> one you got I love that you have all his books this is so <laughs> this is so awesome mm -hmm. so that was judgment it won the 1974 freedom foundation award and became a film starring Martin Sheen and Sean Penn we've actually hosted Sean Penn before anyways I digress <laughs> he also wrote diary of a DA the true story of the prosecutor who took on the mob fought corruption and won as well as the multi-volume legal work trying cases to win He's here today to talk to him about his latest book, Sins of the Fathers. And joining Herbert, as we says, is Honorable Robert C. Longstreth. Bob, as he says on the screen there, <laughs> was appointed to the San Diego Superior Court by Governor Schwarzenegger in July 2008. And he is, ha and has had civil, criminal, probate, and family law assignments. He is currently a trial and settlement judge in the downtown courthouse. After graduating from Yale Law School, he was a law clerk for Judge Stern for two years. He then served in the Civil Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he was lead attorney for the United States in the Agent Orange litigation. And most importantly, and this is most important, met his wife, Veronica, <laughs> a fellow trial attorney. He was reunited with Judge Stern as an associate independent counsel investigating and prosecuting crimes arising from the Iran-Contra affair. He and Veronica moved to San Diego in 1988 and now live in Mission Hills, which is a lovely area of our town here. So with that, gentlemen, have a wonderful conversation and we'll see you in a half hour or so. Thanks, Joy. All right. Thank you, Julie. Uh, hello, uh, Judge. It's great to see you and have a chance to talk about your book. Um, I um, really enjoyed reading it and we had a, a wonderful article in Sunday's uh, Union Tribune, the local paper here uh, about it. Um, I'm hoping that uh, a lot of the people that are watching have had a, a chance to uh, read that article or look at or have some familiarity, but uh, for those who might not, I just wanted to give a really brief update about 
what we're going to be talking about. Um, this book is a follow up to uh, your uh, book, Wolf, which came out a couple of uh, years ago in the, during the pandemic uh, that covered the, the personal and uh, political life of Adolf Hitler from the end of World War I to up when he consolidated power after becoming chancellor with the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. And this book, uh, Sins of the Father, uh, picks up from that point and carries us through the end of 1938 with uh, Munich and uh, Kristallnacht at the end of it. And uh, we may or may not pick up from there with another book. I'm not sure. But uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Sins of the Father, which uh, really does focus on, on Munich, as I saw. There, there are many themes in the book, but the one I saw uh, primarily was the discussion of the 1938 plot against Hitler that uh, you argue was was scuttled by the uh, Munich uh, agreement. Uh, I thought I thought I knew a lot about the the Nazi period and World War II and about Munich. Um, you know, back in my day, Munich was essentially the uh, key geopolitical metaphor of the time, and was no more Munichs until it became no more Vietnams. Um, and I also knew a lot about. Uh, I thought I. First book I ever read, I think, as a history book was William Shire's uh, abridgment for kids of the rise and fall of the Third Reich. And he covers Munich at length. He covers the 1944 uh, plot against Hitler with von Stauffenberg and the bomb and the table leg that saved Hitler and so forth. Uh, very familiar with that. And I have to confess, I this was all completely new to me. The 1938 plot was completely new to me until uh, I read this book. And uh, so I wanted to start by, by having you discuss that and uh, maybe suggest why you think uh, this is not well known. The 38 plot is not well known as the 44 plot was and uh, what made you want to tell the story about, uh, about this? Well, <laughs> uh, Bob, that's a number of questions rolled into one. Okay. Um, First, uh, I think the wisest thing to do would be to say something about what the 1938 plot was. Uh, and it is true that it's not well known. And I think the majority, the vast majority of the folks who are kind enough to listen into this conversation, I, I think will be able to confirm that they never heard of it. In fact, the seminal event of 1937, some months before, took place on November the 5th, 1937. Hitler had a meeting with the heads of his armed forces. It was a very small meeting. Uh, it was the head of the Air Force, Goring. It was the head of the Navy, Raider. Uh, it was the head of the Army, uh, Fritsch. And it was the Minister of War, Bloomberg. And in this small gathering, Hitler really announced his intention to assimilate Austria, and to destroy Czechoslovakia, and it was perfectly plain that he intended to move on from there. What is not known is that from that moment on, senior members of the German uh, general staff went into opposition. It must be remembered that many of these men, perhaps all of them, were uh, veterans of World War I, which after all had only terminated uh, 18 or 19 years before. They were well aware of the horrors of war and they were determined uh, to prevent Hitler from in fact executing his plan. And they understood very well that it wouldn't stop there. Now they tried to persuade him not to go forward. They spoke in terms of their belief that Germany would not be successful, that England and France would rise up and protect at least Czechoslovakia and that the French army and the German Navy would be sufficient to overcome. Uh, did I say German? I mean, the, the, the English Navy and the French army would overcome the German army. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment um, uh, because historians have seized on that for I think uh, a purpose which um, has dulled the point of, of history. In any event, uh, what they were really talking about was the fact that the whole bloody thing was immoral and they wanted very badly to prevent another uh, world war. And so they went into a resistance. Um, they in fact felt so strongly about it that the um, chief of staff, uh, Beck, 
sent an emissary to England to meet with uh, uh, the Prime Minister Chamberlain in an effort to persuade the English to come out strong and threaten war if in fact Hitler moved against Czechoslovakia. Unfortunately, Churchill, uh, uh, Chamberlain refused to meet with him. Uh, he regarded these uh, Germans uh, who were in dissent as actually traitors, uh, view them as traitors to their own country. And so the man who went over, whose name was von Kleist, was relegated to meet with some underlings in the uh, English government, but he was able to meet with Winston Churchill. Churchill at that time was not in the government. Churchill was very receptive to it, uh, to the meeting and to uh, the efforts of the German general staff to prevent a war, and in fact furnished them with a letter in which he indicated that England would go to war if there was an invasion. It wasn't as strong as he would have liked to make it, but he was not in the government. And so uh, what, what has escaped notice in history was, and then there, many of these same men, of course, in 1944, as you pointed out, Bob, were in fact in opposition, did support the von Stauffenberg you know, conspiracy. Beck indeed was the leader of the whole thing. He was going to become the president of Germany if they'd been successful. And of course, they all lost their lives later on because of the failure of the 44 plot. And the interesting thing is that Hitler never knew about the 38 plot, just like most Americans don't know about it now. But they were unmasked because when the Gestapo and the SS investigated the failure of the 44 plot, they uncovered uh, Canaris's diaries. Canaris was the head of uh, the Obwehr, the uh, military intelligence of all of the German armed forces. And he kept a diary in 1938 about their intentions to overthrow Hitler. Uh, and even the ones who were members of the 38 plot, but not members of the 44 plot lost their lives. Now, I, I know that's a very long answer. And I, uh, what can I do? I mean, it's a lot of history that no one's ever heard about, but it's all true. Mm -hmm. The other part of your question is, well, why haven't we heard about it? Well, you know, histor histories and historians usually come from the victors. And uh, um, at least in the early days after World War II, there was, of course, a great deal of antipathy towards the German government, the German people, and uh, a lot of justifiable anger about the, about the war. And nobody seemed very interested in extolling the fact that all of these um, military men tried very hard to prevent the war. They reached out to their opposite numbers in England uh, uh, and were refused meetings. And so when later on these same men uh, lost their lives in 1944, they were applauded to some degree, but it, they were always dismissed as people who rose up only because they were already losing the war. And um, therefore, they, you know, were not regarded as real genuine heroes. But in fact, those same men, uh, or many of them, um, risked their lives in 1938 to prevent the law, the war. And, and that is one of the main um, currents of the book that we wrote, Alan Winter and my co-author and I. And that's a very long answer, but you know, he had a lot of parts to that question. Yeah, I, I know. And, and I think one thing that's so striking is we've all considered Munich to be such a disaster for so long. And, and now it's almost, you know, we learned that was even worse than we thought, that, that uh, it undercut something that might have prevented the war from taking place at all, as opposed to they should have started earlier before he developed strength. Uh, it is documented. Um, and look, Alan Winter and I wrote a novel, and, and novels, you know, are supposed to be not history. Um, and it's certainly true that we wrote a book that we wanted people to be entertained reading. But we had one clear rule, you know, we would not make up history. 
we would not do violence. And we wanted people to learn uh, using this vehicle. And what I have just recounted to you is, 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 is the actual facts that occurred. Now to be really precise, um, when Chamberlain refused to meet with the emissaries of the German general staff, um, um, and they needed support from him because when they intended to rise up, they needed a reason, you know, they had juniors in the army that had to follow them. They decided that even without England's support, they would launch a revolution. They had the troops all identified, the commanding officers of the various divisions and battalions assigned. And they had agreed amongst themselves that when Hitler gave the order to move into Czechoslovakia, they would tell him they needed at least 48 hours to execute the order. And in that period, they would revolt. And they had all the troops lined up. And then when uh, Chamberlain met Hitler in Munich uh, and gave him the Sudetenland, it became impossible for these men to revolt any longer. So the conspiracy was over in 1938 and not revived until 1944. Although the truth of the matter is that some of these conspirators tried to kill him earlier, a couple of them uh, sent a bomb on an airplane with him that didn't explode, but that's that's a story for another book. Um, I, I hadn't seen it yet, but I was told that there's also a, a, a recent Netflix movie that's come out. Um, stars uh, Jeremy Irons as Chamberlain called Munich, the Edge of War. And I, I was told that they had a take that uh, Munich gave England a chance to rearm and actually be stronger than 1939 than it would have been in 1938. Um, do you think there was a, any um, positive aspect to the delay of that? Uh, and, and I guess another question is, uh, what do you think was on Chamberlain's mind and how do you think he should be uh, treated in history? Uh, I do not believe that, that uh, Chamberlain um, um, uh, uh, conceded the Sudetenland in the Munich Agreement uh, because he believed England needed the additional time to rearm. Um, uh, that's just made up nonsense, in my view. Um, I believe at the end of the day, remember that Chamberlain agreed to Sudetenland. He didn't agree to all of Czechoslovakia. Um, when um, Hitler uh, gobbled up the Sudetenland, then in the next uh, year, early in the next year, he gobbled up the rest of Czechoslovakia. Um, I believe that the reason that um, Chamberlain was accommodating was because in his own mind, he recognized that Hitler had some kind of a point to make. We have to remember that Czechoslovakia was a country that was um, created at, right after World War I by the Treaty of Versailles. And uh, the victorious allies simply took parts of other countries and made Czechoslovakia. The Sudetenland was a part of Germany. So that in, in 1919 and 1920, that part of Germany became part of Czechoslovakia and about one and a half million Germans lost their citizenship and their country and became part of another country. And I think that by, the, by 20 years after World War I had ended, most of the world recognized that the Treaty of Versailles was oppressive, had gone too far. Um, and I think that some of that feeling underlie uh, England's willingness um, to recognize that 
there was some legitimate gripes about all these people who had been Germans now being forced to call themselves Czechoslovakians. I don't know, he's gone. But, um, and, and remember, just a few months after that, Hitler took the rest of Czechoslovakia and England didn't do a damn thing about it. But the minute he walked into Poland on September 1st, 1939, they did, they did declare war. Um, they told him either get out within four or five days or we're at war. So I think that was the reason. I think they recognized that uh, there was some legitimate claim that Germany had to the area. I think one reason that the book's particularly timely right now is that we're now seeing the largest invasion by one country of another since uh, World War II that's happening right now. Uh, do you see any parallels between uh, what Putin's doing, uh, his aggression and Hitler's aggression, or how do you compare those? Well, I think he's taking Hitler's playbook. What Hitler did was um, he, he had the Sudeten Germans and he met with the, with the people who were the leaders in the Sudetenland and told them, and it's in our, in, our, uh, in our book, he told them to create trouble, to create incidents so that he could claim to the world that the German speaking people of the Sudetenland uh, were being oppressed uh, by the Czechoslovakian government, which was a government that was simply created out of old cloth uh, by the Treaty of Versailles. Well, you, you, you know, Putin is claiming that they, they have these areas in uh, the Ukraine <laughs> where, uh, uh, which are uh, leaning towards uh, uh, Russia and claims that these people are being unfairly treated. Um, uh, but, but, but he has such a lousy case because, you know, there's no history of anybody uh, creating uh, the Ukraine out of Russia. And, uh, and, and he is bald faced going for the whole enchilada. I mean, he's not going to protect some people living in close proximity. He is encircling um, uh, Ukrainian cities and murdering their civilian population uh, in an outright effort to simply bring them to heel uh, and to try to reassemble as much as he can of the old Soviet Union. I don't know, I, I think it's, it's an outrage. Yeah, a terrible thing. You'd mentioned about um, this being both history and then using fiction to uh, bring out uh, history. And I think another uh, important part of this book that I saw was uh, an attempt to address the view that uh, Hitler, because he was so depraved politically and publicly, must have had a, a completely abnormal and depraved public, uh, private life. And uh, from the historical notes at the end, uh, uh, it's clear and from what you develop that you, you take issue with that, that the way his historians have uh, portrayed him that way. Um, and I, I guess I had a couple of questions. First, uh, why do you think that's an important uh, point to make? And how did the fact that you're using a fictional character uh, and fictional um, uh, events along with historical events uh, help you make that point? Well, you have a wonderful ability to tie a lot of things in one question. So uh, let me see if I can, um, uh, first of all, what is the value of studying the life of Hitler? Well, what's the point of it? It must surely be to learn. It must surely be to educate ourselves so that we can spot a Hitler a coming before he gets there. Uh, and what's the point of studying him if we're not gonna study him with as much accuracy um, uh, without letting our passions get in the way. Man was a beast, a monster. You can call him all kinds of names. He certainly was the greatest criminal of our times. It may be argued successfully of all times. He certainly caused more deaths than anybody, in my view, in, 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 in recorded history that I, I, I know of. But is that any reason to present him as a caricature, you know, a ranting, screaming man who was incapable of having any kind of human relationships, who was uh, virtually a eunuch when it came to women, um, who was uh, uncivilized in his, in his private life? 
Uh, and that's, he's presented in a caricature. And I think it's a great disservice because if the point of studying a man like that is to guard ourselves from ever again entrusting um, high office or enormous power uh, to such a man, then we have to understand the man who he was. And um, most of the presentations of him are just flat out nonsense, you know? I mean, we don't, and we don't like to hear anybody say that because, you know, we get angry, we get furious. And by the way, you know, what about the historians who write this stuff? Uh, you know, they don't want to write stuff that people aren't going to read, and they don't want to write stuff that's going to get people angry. It reminds me of the story of the French Revolution, you know, there's a mob going down the street and a fellow's trailing behind him and somebody says, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm following the mob. He says, what are you doing that for? He said, well, I have to, I'm the leader, you know? <laughs> so, you know, anybody who writes anything that isn't, uh, doesn't present the man as a drooling fang uh, uh, with his fangs hanging down, as you know, people say, what do you, do you like him? No, but I got, you, you have to understand who your enemy is or was was so that we can figure out that never again we'll have him as an is, you know. The man was, uh, he was a bohemian, he wrote poetry, he was an opera goer, he was, his passion was architecture, uh, and as far as women were concerned, he had any number of uh, liaisons, women loved him, and you know, he was very careful to present himself in such a way that no one would, would, would know that. I mean, you had every, all the films that he allowed, you know, he's always in uniform, but he didn't wear a uniform all the time. He didn't wear it around Birch Garden. Um, uh, you know, and he had all these dour looks and the rest of it, but there was one person on earth that was allowed to photograph him as he was. And that was his, what amounted to his, his wife became his wife, but they, for 10 years, they lived together as husband and wife. And she, they met in the photographer's studio. She worked there and she was a camera buff. She took lots of pictures of him and, and they're readily available. I mean, the pictures you can, you can see him the way he was at home. And it, you know, it's not this picture that we're being presented. So um, the really scary thing about the man was that he was quite capable of being loyal he was a tremendously devoted friend. His loyalty to friends, particularly those who preceded the beer hole putsch in 1923 was monumental. Um, um, that isn't to say he was a good man, he was a horrible man. But why, why bother with the man? Why bother reading about him if you wanna read fairy tales? Um, and, and the really funny thing about the book Alan and I wrote the more so Wolf, the preceding book, um, but this one too. This book is, our books are labeled fiction because the story is told through a fictional character that we created. Um, and all these other books that present Hitler in this funny kind of way or related history, but, but, but any fair reading, particularly of the author's notes at the end of uh, Sins of the Fathers and uh, of the Wolf Notes, which we published online, you can get them free of charge. You, you read those notes and you look at those photographs, uh, the ones in Wolf. And by the way, you know where the, the, the book's name Wolf? Because that's what he called himself. He chased women, he called himself Wolf. He signed things Wolf. Um, um, and I think you mentioned that Adolf comes from Adolf or Noble Wolf or the German for Wolf. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he had his sister Paula um, towards the end of the war. I guess when he she, he told her to use the name Wolf, she she lived and died Paula Wolf. Um, but people, nobody knows this stuff. Why? Why? It's it's kind of the same reasoning that we know about the forty four plot that failed by German officers who did it just to save Germany, which was losing a war, but we don't know anything about the 38 effort, which came within a hair's breadth of knocking him over if he hadn't been given um, uh, the Sudetenland uh, in his Munich apartment, which by the way, he one time lived with his half niece, who was his lover, Gailey Rabel, and she suicided there. Um, 
Uh, and Eva Braun once made a comment to a friend of hers watching a picture of uh, Chamberlain sitting on a couch in, uh, in Hitler's Munich apartment. Uh, no one knows the doings, the, the, the doings that we did on that couch. <laughs> I mean, we're not presented with any of that because you see, we're afraid to think of, of Hitler as having a human dimension. It's somehow, you know, is sacrilege. Well, then why, why bother with it? I don't get it. What do you think the value was of uh, creating uh, one of the few fictional characters you have? A lot of the um, characters you have, or most of them are people that uh, really lived. Um, but the protagonist of the book, the main character, you know, Hitler's closest uh, confidant, a fictional character. Uh, why did you set that up as a way of uh, presenting the story and um, what you feel, even though you're using fictional means, is a true picture, a truer picture of, of Hitler? Well, um, you know, we had a choice. We could either tell it in an omnipresent way, you just write a story, or we could tell it through the eyes of an individual. Well, we couldn't pick Heinrich Himmler or Goring or Goebbels, one of, one of those uh, <laughs> folks, so to speak. And uh, so we created a fictional character uh, and the, the task was to make him a close enough friend of Hitler so that he could travel the whole road from uh, from the end of 1918 until the end of 1938. Uh, the end of 1934 is the end of Wolf, the end of 1938. And we know that Hitler was uh, blinded in World War I. We know he spent the last couple of weeks of the war uh, the, uh, in 1918 in a hospital blind. Um, now he claimed <laughs> it was from a gas attack. Uh, we don't think so, uh, but that's a, that's another story. That's the story of Wolf. <clears throat> but in any event, it's indisputable that he was for a period of time blind, and it's indisputable that he was a he was a corporal. So that meant he wasn't, you know, in any kind of private room. He must have been in a ward, and it's indisputable that those hospitals in those days must have been, you know, overrun with patients. So we figured out that, you know, as a blind corporal, he probably couldn't take care of himself. So we had somebody in the next bed who was also disabled, but disabled differently, uh, who helped him. And that brought them together. And that bond formed a friendship, which enabled us to create an association in which our protagonists could remain reasonably close and therefore a prescient witness, a, a, an eyewitness to a lot of the events and be our window and the reader's window uh, through, to, to watch all of this. Um, and that created its own difficulties because obviously readers identified with protagonists and we, we didn't, he, he couldn't become uh, a Jew baiting rabid Nazi. So he had to be um, someone who, uh, even while a friend of Hitler did not approve of what uh, Hitler was doing and from time to time resisted. And of course, the ultimate resistance that we had for our protagonist was to join the, the 1938 conspiracy to uh, depose Hitler uh, and, and remove him from power in order to prevent uh, another, as they would call it at those days, another great war, which we have come to call World War II. I see. I, I wanted to pick up on, on something else, which I hadn't seen discussed in the UT article or something else, but um, I kind of felt I had a connection with when I was uh, clerking for you many years ago, you had, had just finished judgment in Berlin, and we're starting to do a lot of research into the German judiciary uh, in the Nazi period, uh, and how people, you know, many of whom, you know, of course, many of whom were not, but many of them were people of intelligence and good faith and kind of come to grips with the fact that they now had to uh, enforce unjust Nazi laws and also with the fact that uh, 
you know, ultimately justice was going to be what served Hitler's ends. Uh, and I, I saw a little bit of that in, or, or a, a theme of that in this book, um, primarily with the trial of um, uh, Werner von Fritsch, who was the commander in chief of the army, who Hitler then forced out when he objected to the war plans that were articulated in uh, the November 5th, 1937 meeting that you uh, started with. And so I, I was curious, especially since you know, we, we both uh, uh, served as judges, uh, how that research that you had done into the German judiciary, you know, carried over and informed this book and, uh, you know, what, what, what we might learn from, from that experience. Well, uh, that's a very good question, Bob. I'm glad you didn't ask me all those kind of questions when we worked together. <laughs> uh, and any of it, in those days, you were the ones that provided the answers for me and made me look good. But the point Yes, uh, um, I was very interested, and that goes back well over 40 years ago, in how the German judiciary, which was, you know, the old German judiciary before the advent of Hitler was a, was a highly uh, intelligent and principled, it, it, it was quite different, um, it chose in a much different way than the American judiciary, you know, I know you you stood for election uh, um, at some point, and, um, and in our country, people go from practice to the judiciary. Some like me leave the judiciary after a number of years, but in in, in places like uh, Europe, um, to, being a judge is a profession from the beginning. You 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 leave law school and you go into the government service. You may be a prosecutor in a small court, then you become a judge in a small court, then you become a prosecutor in a bigger court. So the German judiciary had a great tradition of independence. And of course, Hitler tore that down because he could not stand to have an independent judiciary. And he created what we now, what, what he called the Volksgerichtshofen, which was the people's court. Now this was not Judge Judy, you understand. These were judges which were handpicked by him uh, to be reliable, particularly in cases involving treason, which was anything he called uh, called it. Uh, um, uh, and uh, there's a lesson here too, and uh, this is very difficult because um, he wanted results in his courts. Um, and it was a terrible thing. We have to guard against the same urges ourselves. Um, uh, everybody says they want an independent judiciary, and I believe they mean it. But by the same token, all too often, it, any result in a specific case seems so, so all fired and important that we're willing to uh, stack the deck. Uh, we're not willing to rest on an independent judiciary. And I mean this on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we're willing to go to extraordinary lengths to guarantee that the people we put into those roles are going to decide the way we want them to on the issues that we believe are so important, whether it's uh, uh, right to choose or right to life, or uh, is, is the constitution to be interpreted uh, literally or is the constitutional living document that we're free to uh, navigate with to, to some degree? And, and we have to be very, very careful that while our positions are of course legitimate, that we not take them to the point that uh, we just try to guarantee results in court because if we destroy the legitimacy of the judgments that come out of court. If people begin to believe that it's just reflecting the political uh, ideals and faiths or issues of the, of, of, of the momentary people who put them in, I think we'll lose more than we will lose on any given issue. And by the way, Hitler wasn't so greatly successful in some respects, but in 1943, he actually went before the Reichstag and made a speech attacking the entire German judiciary. This is after he had primed the deck by putting, you know, the people's court in place. And he screamed out and demanded the right to be 
termed the chief justice of Germany in order to uh, be able to further cow the German judiciary. Um, but that's, a, that's also a different story than the one we, we have uh, in this book. This is a wide ranging conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we covered. Uh, were there any um, parts of the book that you found um, particularly difficult to write or um, particularly difficult to get across um, uh, what you wanted to, to, to convey? Um, were, were there any particular techniques that you used? Um, for example, I, I know the main character is uh, amnesic for a while. How did that uh, uh, factor into the, the, the craft of you putting this together? Well, first of all, as I said, the, the main character is a vehicle, <clears throat> a window which we could look through. So his eyes become our eyes. Uh, his eyes become our eyes. And, and um, uh, that, that created difficulties because we had to have him be in a lot of places. Uh, we have a meeting with Churchill because there was a meeting with Churchill and von Kleist, the emissary of the German generals did meet with Churchill and Churchill did give him a secret letter. And by the way, Hitler never found out about that letter until 1944. And when he found out about that letter, he killed von Kleist. Uh, who was unknown, his trip was unknown to Hitler from 1938 until 1944. So it was difficult in the sense that, you know, we had to have him be in a lot of different places. We had to have him be in Austria when Austria was, um, when the German troops marched in and it was hardly an invasion though, they were widely welcome. Um, we, we, we had to have him be when Hitler terrified Schusnick, the uh, chancellor of Austria, we had a, we had to have him be with the German generals and, and we had to make it realistic because you know we, we couldn't make a cartoon out of all this. So there was some difficulty in that. Um, and uh, then too, you know, you can't tell every single thing that happened over the four year period of, uh, of sins or the 16 year period of Wolf. So they have to make a selection process of what historical events are important um, what do we want the reader to come away with in terms of seeing the most significant things that happened uh, in that period of history? For example, the Avion Conference in which all the countries of the world, you know, got together to talk about the fact that all the Jews are being persecuted in Germany and, Germ and, and Ger the Germans wanted them out and none of the countries would take them. And they had this big conference uh, convened by President Roosevelt and the net result of the conference is that not a single country agreed to take any Jews. Um, so we had to have Friedrich there, you know. Yes, he was there as well. <laughs> he was there, no. But everything that he reported about what happened at the Avion Conference, all the speeches that were made by the American delegation, by the French delegation, all the speeches were accurate portrayed. So we didn't make up history. We rather made up a character who was able to report it by being there when obviously, uh, you know, it's highly unlikely that any one character could have done it. But our guy, our guy did it. Yeah, he did. And, and you also had him, uh, you know, uh, having uh, romantic relationships with, you know, Clara Bartil and I think Lillian Harvey and uh, so forth. Why were, were those uh, uh, people selected? What was, what were you, uh, what were well, you kind of trying to, to uh, uh, say or to entertain in, in that way? Well, the main thing was to create a realistic situation. So uh, we couldn't have a cardboard person walking through and we, but we, but, but the, but the women that he, uh, um, encounters were real women. Um, um, Lillian Harvey, uh, who is predominantly more so in, in Wolf than in Sins, she was a really famous actress. Nobody knows of her today, but in her day, she was as large as Dietrich um, uh, 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 or uh, a Swedish actress flew out of my mind. 
Um, Garbo? <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Um, uh, she was very famous. And in fact, we have her in uh, leaving in Wolf. She leaves and goes to Hollywood, which she did. And in Sins, we have her return to Germany, which she did. And in Sins, we have her help uh, a homosexual, um, uh, a gay uh, per uh, performer uh, who the Gestapo wanted to get, she helped smuggle him out, which she did. And she was arrested. So we wanted our, our protagonist to live in a setting in, in which he had, you know, uh, some life. Mm -hmm. But even here, the, the people that we had him associated with were, were real, were real women. And it was also important to understand that, you know, women played a role. Uh, this not just a story of what some fellows did. Uh, there was some women who uh, who were very brave as well. And I think the main romantic interest in in Sins, as opposed to Wolf, is is Clara Bartiel. What was what was her background? Who was who was she in real life? She was a photographer. Mm -hmm. And an actress, um, and he kind of met her through his association with Lillian Harvey, who was, a, as I say, I mean, if anybody wants to use Wikipedia, they'll find out uh, just how prominent Lillian, Lillian Harvey was. Although uh, her name is pretty well lost now. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think we're getting uh, uh, close to, to the end of our time here. I just wanted to conclude by asking if there's uh, anything that we haven't covered. It's It's been uh, hopefully wide ranging, as, as you said, uh, that you uh, wanted to have people as a, as a takeaway from the book or uh, uh, address to them. I, you certainly give me a fair opportunity to speak a very long time. And I <laughs> got to say, um, um, I, I, uh, I, whether you read the book or, or not, anybody listening, what I really encourage you to do is read the notes that Alan Winter and I uh, put out on the internet, the notes to Wolf. They're very extensive. The notes to Sins are in the book and you have to buy the book to get that, but you don't have to buy uh, Wolf to read the notes to Wolf. Just go on the internet, plug in, notes to wolf i guess uh, i'm not very i think you need to be staying on message here you know we're, we're selling books right <laughs> uh, that's not what i do for a living you know <laughs> okay. uh, i'm more look I, I, we we didn't we we have professions he and i and this is mm -hmm. this is what we, we we wrote these things to make a contribution i hope we have uh, i hope people read it um this is not primarily a mercantile venture for me. Right, I understand. But it is for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is for you, yes. Forgive me, June. Uh, bye, oh, bye. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, was in the, I was in the background I'll laughing. I'll your host. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't buy my book, buy other people's books as well. Exactly. Well, <laughs> it was a great conversation. Oh, no, I'm just teasing you, Herbert. It's like, yeah, but um, is there, do you have a website or does your co-author have a website where they would find those notes on Wolf? His notes on Wolf, uh, I believe if you put that in, you'll, you'll find it. If you just it. Google that, it'll just pop up with the. With I think so. And I think okay. that actually is the URL, notesonwolf.com. You oh. just put that in, so. There you go. Perfect. It, it, well, it's, but it's in, the website, meantime, I think. in the meantime, you can order both Wolf and Sins of Our Father, Sins of the Fathers from Warwick's too. <laughs> So oh, sorry. I, oh I, no! Too you could do Judgment in Berlin too. They they put out another edition of that. Okay, there you year. go. All uh, right. Well, this was a it was a, such a fascinating conversation. And Bob, there were comments going on in the um, chat of Facebook. Everybody was just loving your questions, so that's why they were thanks, just saying, thanks, "Everyone, you just go on there." So, um, Herbert, Bob, thank you for being with us today. Um, again. Sins of the Fathers. Congratulations on the publication of that, Herbert. And Bob, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Pleasure to be with together. you. Together. Thanks. Bye. We'll see everybody later. Bye-bye.